So the next thing we're going to look at is what happens on a context switch. So this is extremely important. So remember that there's a, there's a, for every every process there's a page table. Okay, there's one page table uh, for every process, uh, and so. Uh, it's extremely important that we don't muck up the translations between the different processes. Okay. So recall each process has its own page table. Okay. There's one page table per process and a virtual address table. But there's only a single TLB in the system. So the TLB itself uh, is shared. Okay. So there's a high internal hardware resource, there's one TLB uh, per processor and it's shared between all the threads or processes that run on that processor. So the TLB translation that are being cached are no longer valid when a context switch happens. When a context switch happens, an entirely new process is going to start to run. It has its own translations. It has its uh, own page tables. And in such cases, um, the TLB entries are no longer valid. Okay. So the options are invalidate the TLB so which means set the valid bits of all TLB entries to zero. Simple, but um, is expensive in terms of performance. For example, what if you frequently switch between processes? Right? In all such cases, a TLB is going to be flushed, and you're going to keep, keep having to reload the page table or the TLB on every access. Okay? So this is one of the major costs behind a context switch. So the context switch cost, like we discussed earlier in segment three, uh, in the first week of classes, um, or the second week, the first cost is just moving the process. But the bigger cost is if your TLB is flushed, um, and then this process starts to run, then it needs to reload all the entries into the TLB from the page table. And that's a very expensive process. One option of um, preventing this is to include the process ID in the TLB itself. Uh, this is obviously not a software only solution, it's an architectural solution and it exposes the notion of processes to hardware when previously it did. Okay, so one way to do it is to tag the, the TLBs with the ID of the process so that you know exactly which process the translation belongs to. All right, so now that we've looked at TLBs, let's look at the overall view of the system with caches plus TLBs. I'm going to continue the discussion here, assuming that you have basic computer architecture knowledge about what a cache is. Okay, so for those of you not familiar with it, a cache is a two-dimensional uh, hardware data structure. It's essentially a hash table. You have some number of things known as ways, which are essentially number of entries per bucket, and some number of entries known as sets or rows, which are essentially the number of buckets that the hash table has. So in general, the cache uh, one of the things you're going to look at is um, virtually addressed versus physically addressed caches. So this uh, really corresponds to a problem in hardware or it can be thought of as a hardware limitation. Uh, and the reason the operating system is important is because this controls what sort of translations the operating system should be allowed to do. So let's take a look at this as we're going along the next few slides, things will become a little bit more clear. So the cache can be virtually addressed for one. Uh, the virtual address is broken into a tag and tag index and an offset to look at the data on the cache. Uh, the challenge with this is, sim is that now the cache tags or the data are also virtually tagged. Same challenge as the TLB. On a context switch, you would have to either flush or you need to store the process ID with the tag. And the address ID translation is only needed upon the cache miss. Um, and if you look at it, it could, the cache could also be physical addressed. Uh, this is the virtual address is first converted to the physical address, and then uh, the physical address is used to find the data. So now, even on context switches, the data can live across um, the overall, um, even in the translations themselves, or the TLB itself is flushed. Virtual address caches, in general, used to be faster, but they make sharing data between processes complicated. For example, what if you wanted the same page to appear in the virtual address of two different processes? Um, now you have the limitation that you can't really share it because on every context which your cache is going to be flushed. Uh, so 
most common system that is employed in uh, today is a TLB or has been for the last 10 years is a TLB plus a physically addressed cache. So what we first have is a virtual address uh, indexing to the TLB. This itself is TLB. Um, what it generates is a physical frame number. So the physical frame number comes down at this point. Uh, you couple it with the offset, you get the physical address, and then you use that physical address to go look up the cache, which has the actual data. So note that the TLB itself is caching only the translations, while the data cache is caching the actual data that you get from uh, memory. And in this case, we've used a fully associative table. There are some numbers, just uh, you can look at the correspondence between numbers shown here and the number of you know buckets or the sets in this case. In this case, uh, there are no there are no there are no multiple entries per bucket itself. Um, there's only one entry per bucket, but there are many buckets. Okay. So the TLB lookup sequence um, in general proceeds along the following direction. First, you do the TLB lookup. Uh, this could result either in a hit, uh, sorry, a miss or a hit. If it's a miss, then you got to look up the translation, and so then you do the page table walk. So step one is check if it's a hit, a miss. Step two is if it's a miss, uh, now you got to do the translation, and you, at that point the page can either be in memory, in which case it's um, you know you reload the TLB and you're go, good to go. So this is known as a minor page fall in operating system terminology. The major page fall is when the page is not even in memory and it's been swapped out to the disk. In such case, there's a page fault and OS loads the page uh, from the disk. Okay. All right. And then if the TLB lookup itself succeeds, then um, you check the permissions and if you're permitted, then you get the physical address that's sent to the cache. Note that the cache itself is a separate uh, storage structure that could either miss or hit. Uh, if the protection check fails, then you have protection fault, and then you go back and throw an exception. Uh, in this case, it goes like false. So, the address translation in the TLB um, first happens um, at, at the initial stages of the processor pipeline. Um, so, this in this case, you're looking at instructions, which are also sim loaded from memory in general. Um, and then you've got the data caches, which also looks at the TLB in order to access the data. Uh, you do need mechanism to cope with additional layers to the TLB. There are certain options such as load on the clock. Uh, you know, you pipeline the TLB and the cache access so that you can have multiple um, accesses outstanding at the same time. You can make a cache virtually address, which is what is commonly used today. So you take the offset from your uh, address range. So you, you have your address, you have your offset, and your physical page number or not. This offset is the same for both the VPN and the PPN. So just the offset part. This offset part is the same. Okay. So you just use this part to index into the cache and store things. And that's an that's the option that's mostly used with uh, processors these days. So what that allows you to do is do a parallel access where the cache index uh, comes from this offset part. Note this is the offset, this is the page index itself. So the cache index comes from the offset part and then you don't need to do the translation because it's the same across both the VPN and the PPN and it doesn't really matter which one you use, they're both the same. Right? And uh, both the cache access and the TLB access in such cases can begin simultaneously um, and when both of them complete, you then check whether it's a hit or a miss. Only at that point can you check that. But the access of the cache itself can be done in parallel. Okay. Uh, here's a couple of slides uh, further showing the data and the life of an uh, instruction address. Uh, I would encourage you to go over it in the offline. There's also a table enumerating all the possible hit miss possibilities between a TLB, a page, which is essentially pages in memory, and the data is actually cached in a data cache. So this cache really refers to the data cache. Okay. Um, and so you can either have hit, 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 TLB hits, the page is also in your cache, and the page is in memory. You can have the case where the TLB hits, the page is in memory, but the data is not in the cache. Uh, and then you've got other cases where the TLB hits, 
your page is not in your cache. Uh, page is not in memory, but things are in your cache. Um, this really is not uh, cannot occur in the sense that in today's systems, you ensure that things are flushed when the page is taken out of the memory. Um, and then you have cases where there's nothing in the TLB and the cache. Uh, then there are a whole bunch of other cases where it's similarly corresponding to the TLB in the system. Note that the TLB and the cache itself both have independent uh, replacement policies. Uh, you can independently replace the entries in your cache in the TLB, and the absence of an entry in a TLB, for example, does not mean that the data is not is not not in your cache. It is possible that the TLB may miss, and your cache may have the data. It's also possible. Um, the TLB may hit, but the data is not in your cache. Okay, so both ways are possible. Uh, they are all, they are both independent systems. With that, we move on to demand paging. 